on the, the test in two weeks. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. Um, creative nonfiction. You ready? So what, you know, what is the definition? We kind of held off on that a little bit. We're now going to get into that finally. Um, and the way I present, by the way, is usually I show pictures like this and I talk and, you know, you just listen and whatever you get from that, you can write down. I don't do a lot of bullet points. I find that kind of annoying. So, um, you know, but I do do some text once in a while. So, first of all, to, to understand what creative nonfiction is, um, I want to tell you a story about this guy. Anyone know who this is here? A writer, yes. <laughs> Looks like a writer, very writerly it's looking. It's not Poe. Someone guessed Thoreau, last class, not Thoreau. It's a friend. What's that? Whitman. Not Whitman. This is a young Emerson. or younger Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Who, um, so for the juniors in the room, you know, uh, you should know Emerson, kind of, a little bit. You didn't read Emerson? Yeah. Okay. Like you read, you read Thoreau. Everyone read, read Thoreau. Yeah, yeah. Similar guy, kind of guy, essayist mainly. Um, to, to understand creative nonfiction, I'm going to bring you back before creative nonfiction. So Emerson has nothing to do with creative nonfiction directly. But to understand it, I want to tell you a story about Emerson and this thing here, which is called the Panharmonicon. All right? So the Panharmonican and, uh, and this man are really at the essence of creative nonfiction without having anything directly to do with the creative nonfiction. And so here's why. This guy, Emerson, um, in around 1830s, uh, is um, in America frustrated with the sort of genre of talking about things. All right, and back then we we call them sermons, right? You know, someone gets up in front of a podium and and tells you about this and that, right? And he didn't like this. The the structure was, um, well, I I actually have a quote for you. He says, um, you know, the, the he was he says that the sermons were with their cold mechanical preparations for delivery most decorous, meaning too well mannered, right? Um, fine things, pretty things, wise things, but no arrows, no axes, no nectar, no growling. And he wanted to, um, in this frustration, wanted to find a sort of new literature. So, that's where he is, 1830. And then this thing comes along. This guy, Johann Matzel, or Maltzel, uh, is a German con artist. And he comes to comes to town and sets up this machine called the Panharmonicon, this giant contraption, cranks this crank, you know, like three or four times, and uh, or at least I, I imagine that's how many times, uh, and steps away, pulls a lever, I imagine, and uh, you know lets this thing go, and it basically plays an entire orchestra of music without any musicians playing it. The He's also, yeah, probably a swindler and, and, and dubious fellow in other ways. But in this case, he's also, you know, kind of an inventor, uh, at least in terms of creating a, a sort of novelty like this. Now, this is like, you know, for people to go, wow, you know, 1830s, right? It's like a whole orchestra without any people. Like, you know, next are robots, and they're going to take over the world probably, right? So. You know, this was a pretty amazing contraption, the fact that like it played this whole orchestra with that anyway. But Emerson saw this as like an epiphany. Can you imagine where I'm going with this? He sees all these instruments together playing music, and he has this epiphany that this is where this is his new literature. Right? And he literally says, um, you know, that he'd been looking for a panharmonica of, of literature. Um, and he says, here everything is admissible. He's talking now about writing. Uh, everything is admissible, philosophy, ethics, divinity, criticism, poetry, humor, fun, mimicry, anecdote, jokes, ventriloquism, all the breadth and versatility of the most liberal conversation, highest and lowest personal topics, 
all are permitted, and all may be combined into one speech. So that was what we now know as the essay, just the essay, right? You know, it, and he saw this as a sort of place where we could, instead of trying to talk about specific things, everything's game. You can be, you know, you can be writing about nature and all of a sudden writing in a sort of verse form, and that's okay. You know, before that it was like, you know, there has to be a very strict following of certain genres. And this is the first time in the world where people were, you know, he kind of decided to combine a bunch of stuff. And this is creative nonfiction. Isn't that, isn't that the kind of, the, the essence of what creative nonfiction is? And so, creative nonfiction about a hundred years later, you know, almost 200 years later, right, because we're in 2011, um, has a similar idea, which is essentially the, a, a combination of two things, all right? And uh, it's, it's sort of a hybrid of literature and nonfiction. And so, yes, yeah, so we have a, either a lime nut or a coca lime. Coca lime. Coca here. That must have been nasty. <laughs> it's definitely not real. That's not real. Yeah. <laughs> Although, I'm sure uh, people are working on it. So, the hybrid, the main combination of, there's two main combinations. First of all, creative nonfiction, I can tell you just simple definitions that it is it also another sort of combination of everything, a sort of panharmonic kind of literature. But in this case, it is mainly a combination of literature and journalism, or nonfiction. On one hand, you have the nonfiction aspects, right? You have the, it's an essay form usually. Uh, there's some sort of explanation or exposition which you get at, like, you know, the beginning of Methland here. Uh, certain rhetorical patterns, like, you know, I've got a thesis statement, like, you know, meth is really the, uh, is sort of symbolic of the way our country is headed in general. And I'm going to support that with examples. Uh, and it's always a focus on facts, right? Research. And then on the other side, there's aspects of narration, story setting, characterization. That's the creative. That's the cre this is the fictional devices that can be used, blended with the facts, the essay format. Got it? So that's the kind of those are the two sides of it, but really, especially towards the end of the trimester, you're going to see, you know, things that are really out there in terms of experimenting with combining all sorts of genre aspects. A couple other fiction strategies we're going to look at, and these are my only bullet points <laughs> for the day. Uh, sort of like uh, maybe like Pulp Fiction or, if you, you know, like those kind of Tarantino kind of movies. You you're going to see some experimenting with chronology, uh, you know, syntax, dialogue, description. Before when I said, you know, I could, you know, as a nonfiction writer, even though it seems unethical, I could guess what you're thinking right now. I'd, we call that perhapsing, or at least uh, Lee Gutkin, who came up with a lot of these terms, says that. So I can, I can, you know, say perhaps this, perhaps that. Uh, simultaneity, things happening kind of at the same time but in different areas. We're going to see that within Cold Blood. Characterization, point of view, definitely comes up in Methland right off the bat. 